Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever it is that you are and wherever you may be. Thank you very much for making us a part of your day. I am Brad Franklin, the creative content writer here in Chesterfield, and I'm very glad to tell you that Chesterfield by Mike is on the air once again. Now, a lot of times, um, you know, we do what I like to think of as like current event sort of podcast, right? So we're telling you about something that's coming up. We're telling you about something you want to go to. And then we also do things that are uh, more educational, right? More informational. And that is certainly um, the sort of vein that we're in today. I'm very glad to welcome John Pagano, who is the um, interpretation supervisor at Henricus Historical Park. John, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you coming on the show. I know that... Um, you know, the, the topic today is Juneteenth, and, and there's a lot that goes into the Juneteenth holiday that, that we're, we're going to dig into, and certainly the celebration of, of what that day meant for so many people in this country, both at the time and certainly going forward. Before we dig into that, I kind of want to get a little bit uh, more on your background, um, kind of one of those things I like to do um, on the podcast from time to time when I've got a, a guest on, especially somebody like you who has such an interesting sort of background. How did you come to be, like, how does one become the interpretation supervisor at a historical park? Like, that's not, I can imagine growing up that you, you, you might not have had necessarily that specific title down the path as you thought of, like, you know, where you would end up in life. And I'm just curious, how did you sort of become uh, the, 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 the interpretation supervisor there? And, and what does that entail? Well, that's a really good question. A lot of people ask me that actually when I'm on site all the time, people ask me that visitors, um, you know, it, the history world's kind of interesting. You have to be, uh, willing to be a, a bit of a gypsy to move around and to, right. uh, kind of, uh, travel a bit to get experience. And, uh, that's, that's pretty much what I did. You know, I grew up in the Hudson Valley of New York, you know, graduated from a, a small state college there. And one thing that was, uh, uh, put into me being raised in, in that area, uh, was the value of history. It's right. been my, my, my grandparents, my, my family. Um, and so one thing I, I was kind of smitten by mm -hmm. was a lot of the history of Virginia. So ultimately I wanted to get down here. Um, so, you know, when I first got involved in history up there, I got involved in living history. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was uh, in a civil war organization that was a reactivated unit from the civil war okay. um, for ceremonies. And, uh, that uh, regiment, uh, when I was a teenager, drew me in and gave me my first experiences presenting to the public in a historic setting. Right. And then after college, I, I had the idea of getting my degree in either education or history. And I mm -hmm. uh, dabbled in both. I, I was a teacher for a while, special education for eight years. Okay. Worked part-time at some museums. I worked at a museum in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, of right. all places. Uh, a fort in Savannah, Georgia. I worked uh, through... Uh, Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, mm -hmm. and uh, in between all that time, I was hired to be an advisor and a consultant on uh, Civil War documentaries and okay. films, uh, and I just had a, a very a, a great depth of knowledge and uh, applied those mm -hmm. to both um, a film setting right. and also a museum setting. Right. And that was, that was the big thing. And then, then I started publishing articles, you know, some small magazines here and there, uh, the Civil War, Revolutionary War. Um, and so this builds up a trust in the community that you deal with. Right. And then when I was working at Jamestown, uh, the position opened at Henricus in 2007. And fortunately, by word of mouth, some of the people who at Henricus knew, uh, knew of me and brought me in mm -hmm. and hired me into the position I'm in now. Um, and because of the way I approach history, which is um, multi-layered, right? It's just not one piece. It's, right. it's all the history that kind of transformed the landscape there. Uh, my interest grew into what took place there before Europeans, mm. uh, the native element, uh, then certainly through the 17th, 18th, 19th century, all the way through what turned us into a museum on that ground. Right. Uh, and that's my job. My job is to know those facts. Yeah. Now in terms of, for, for folks who you know, may have visited the website, typically, you know, you don't know it, but John is one of the first people that you see on the, on the, you know, depending on which image, you know, is, is, is in the carousel at that point. Do you remember the first time you heard the story of Juneteenth? Because um, as a kid from Southern Virginia, you know, it, it was a long time before I heard it. And I, the, the sort of parallel there, right, of that this right. is something that took a while for a lot of us here to hear about, right? You know, considering that one of the one of the central, you know, tenets of this story 
is that it took so long for word of the Emancipation Proclamation to reach Texas, you know, to which essentially is the holiday that that is celebrated here. Do you remember your what were your your earlier memories, or when did you sort of hear for the first time about Juneteenth? I probably couldn't put a date on it. I know that you know, dabbling into um, as a teenager, you know, I read every Civil War book I could possibly get my hands on. Right. Uh, then working more deeply into the living history world, museum world. Um, you know, I became pretty intimate with a lot of these, what we'll call the side stories, right. right. Mm-hmm. That are now in prominence. And, uh, I was probably college post college when it really started to kind of make its way into my uh, mm-hmm. consciousness. Yep. And certainly in the last probably decade or two, um, because it's been more illuminated. Yeah. You start, you start, I want to get a little more deeper into right. that. Yeah. Um, and you know, knowing the layers again of, of, of the emancipation topic, yeah, you, you're, you're connected to it. Right. And so, you know, that's, that's where it all, that's where it all came to be. Yeah. Now there's a, sp- there's an interesting connection between Juneteenth um, and Henricus. And I kind of want to get into that uh, um, next. Talk to me a little bit about sort of what that connection, the, what we've learned about the, the, the connection between those things and, and sort of that um, the way that the park sort of celebrates this tells that story um, and maybe even for those people who aren't aware of the Juneteenth story, maybe take them through a little bit of, of, of what Juneteenth is all about. Yeah. Well, you know, it's an interesting story. You know, I, as a historian, I've, I always go backwards, yeah. uh, you know, even back to the revolution, uh, when, you know, George Washington is posed with the, the question of, uh, do our, um, our black, uh, residents, mm-hmm. do they serve, you know, and, uh, in that time period, in the time of the revolution and, and including Virginia, uh, if you were a free black male, mm-hmm. you were supposed to be in the militia. Mm. Uh, and if you're in the militia, does that mean you can serve in this new United States army? Right. And almost all the States did. And mm-hmm. Washington is now in a position as a slave owner to be asked that question. And he says, yes, this is basically what we're going to do. Right. So now you have men serving in uniform for the foundation of the country. So now you fast forward that uh, into the 19th century and things have changed. It right. kind of went backwards a bit. Right. So, you know, the civil war breaks out and uh, for, you know, many layers of what people think about the causes of the war, it, it's always going to be, it's going to be tied in some way to slavery. Um, can't get away from that. The question is, and people like Frederick Douglass and, um, people like Lincoln, the others mm-hmm. the question is what role will those that were held in slavery play in this right. conflict? Right. Uh, and it was a hard one because not everybody, ever, not everybody saw the same answer, uh, northerners or southerners really. Mm. Uh, and so when Lincoln is posed with this in, in the fall of 1862, you know, they're, they've been dabbling in the idea of officially making, um, you know, regiments out of, uh, either freed slaves or those that lived in the North that were never enslaved. They were mm. free men. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lincoln eventually will sign the Emancipation Proclamation. It will go into effect January 1st, 1863. And uh, there's already been black soldiers fighting, though. And right. one of those guys who starts it is this General Benjamin Butler, mm-hmm. who is a fervent abolitionist from New England. Uh, he becomes the uh, military governor of New Orleans and does, does a bunch of uh, things down there. Don't make him very popular. Mm. And one of the things he wanted to experiment on is the idea of um, uh, men of color, as it's called, serving in the army mm-hmm. in state units. Can't do it officially as a federal thing, but right. that's what he's going to dabble in. Uh, and they start to show up on the battlefield. And then Massachusetts will get into it and they'll authorize the raising of the 54th and 55th Massachusetts regiments. And uh, that will be famous through the movie Glory. Okay, right. Uh, And they will have certain successes. Mm -hmm. Um, They're raised uh, 1862 and 1863. They serve in in South Carolina. So what you're looking at is there's instances now Mm -hmm. where it's starting to show. And now the federal government's put in a position where we're kind of behind it. Right. Right. And finally, it gets authorized. Uh, Lincoln uh, finally gets the Emancipation Proclamation to effect January 1st, 63, which says basically that if you are a slave in rebel territory, helping the rebel war effort, you're in, this is in rebellion, uh, then you are to be basically treated as a part of the war 
And because you're helping the war, you're going to be freed from that. Right. So now that is going to create not just a, uh, the federal armies are liberators. Again, changing the focus of the war from saving the Union to being liberation. Right. Once you start having the armies free tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of slaves, those formerly enslaved people, the men, Mm -hmm. now have an option to possibly fight. Right. And as Frederick Douglass said uh, in many different ways, once you get the brass stamp of U.S. on your on your buckle, mm-hmm. you're wearing the eagle on your buttons. Uh, there is no force on earth that can keep you from citizenship. Right. So now it's not just freedom. Right. It's the question of citizenship. And, right. And, and so that that becomes big. So now what you have is a lot of these formerly enslaved people have layers of what they're fighting for: freedom right. of themselves finding a freedom of their families and mm-hmm. now it's becoming forging and saving this new union. Right. And then in terms of the, um, you know, I know you guys, you, you do have a lot of different, um, you know, education aspects of, of what you do. You, there's obviously a, a certain component of the different um, sort of exhibits that are open uh, at different times. One of them obviously is the, um, those forgotten soldiers mm-hmm. of Juneteenth. Right. Talk to me a little about sort of the, um, I think it's the 116th mm-hmm. um, U S colored troops of Dutch gap canal from 64 to 65. Tell me a little bit more about that group. Yeah. So really history is catching up with us at our site. Um, Gen- General Benjamin Butler, again, for an abolitionist, He's the commander of the Army of the James, whose army will be assigned by the War Department to kind of come and take the back door to Richmond, cooperating with General Grant's armies north of Richmond. Butler basically is a, is a safe zone and a supporter of these newly raised United States color troops. Remember, the federal government now is authorizing these right. troops. Uh, and there's a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And some generals in the Union Army are not too jazzed about that because some of their men aren't sure they want to serve with these guys. Well, Butler's like, I'll take them. Right. And he does. Uh, the one sixteenth uh, United States color troop is raised from formerly enslaved men in Kentucky. Okay. And they are raised, uh, there, uh, and they're raised and then sent to the, f- literally to the front within months. Uh, the one sixteenth comes to Dutch gap, canal uh to be assigned to work on general butler's military canal taking place there which is henrikus historical park right uh there's a problem and it shows up general uh, william bernie who's one of the uh, federal commanders says look I, i some of these guys who are you know just literally coming out of the fields former slaves a lot of them first sergeants and start they they're illiterate mm-hmm. how can they do their military performances and so what you have is the organizations with the army like the U.S. Christian Commission, the U.S. Sanitary Commission. But the Christian Commission uh, comes to Butler's Army, and one of their jobs is to educate these soldiers. Right. So now you have schools being set up in these camps. Right. So they're getting schooling in military, schooling how to read and write. All these things are taking place. But they're also under fire. And at Dutch Gap Canal, they are going to be put to the test. Mm-hmm. Um, so it'll be uh, Colonel William Woodward's uh, 116th USCT that have a lot of the responsibilities there, specifically Captain uh, Thomas O'Reilly's Company C, who will be the garrison there for several months. Um, and what they have to do is protect the guys working there. Right. And dig, you know, tens of thousands of cubic you know, uh, yards of dirt right. out of that canal. Right. And the Rebs, it's a sitting target because they right. know exactly where they where are. Where they're going to be, right. Yep. So those guys are there, you know, doing service. And then at the end of that service, the canal, you know, is done. Um, They, they did some really interesting military acts there. Uh, But then they're being asked by Colonel Wayne Woodward, who's now brigade commander. Hey, one sixteenth, you proved yourself. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give you a special uh, treat on this last campaign. Uh, You and a few others are going to be marching with me, chasing down General Lee's army to Appomattox. Mm Mm-hmm. And so the 116th goes from Dutch Gap Canal on the march, the last fighting days, and are under fire the last moments at Appomattox. Huh. There to see Lee's army surrender in some right. ways. Uh, and from there they march back, and now they're going to be training. And whereas other regiments go home after Lee's surrender, right. these guys are United States soldiers. So they have to wait to be, you know, what are we going to do next? Right. And so they're uh, put on transports at City Point in May. 
Uh, and then by June, they're on their way to Texas to guard the U.S.-Mexican border. Right. Uh, but also there to, if there's any last uh, rebel, you know, armies, they're going to go after them. Right. By the time they get there, that's fizzled out. Mm-hmm. So all they're going to be doing is now uh, watching the border. Right. But they pass through Galveston, Texas, on the their camp there mm-hmm. and set up there on june 19th which is the day yeah so they're there when the federal garrison commander of galveston is announcing and and publishing right this order of emancipation those guys are there to show uh the black population of that community that's not just white soldiers now right it is us as part of this new country right that you're going to be a part of and now you're free yeah it must have been huge for yeah. those people to see that yeah. Um, so they are, they are tied to that moment at Galveston and Juneteenth yeah. and where they start. Most of them, it was Kentucky, maybe mm-hmm. from somewhere else passing through Virginia fighting, uh, in this war. And then they're serving till 1866, uh, along that Mexican border. Yeah. You've got a couple of images, um, here yeah. with us. And now for those of you who are watching the show, you'll see these on the screen, but John, I want you to kind of describe to me what we're looking at. Um, and then sort of talk me through sort of what we, what we do know about the images, um, that you, that you're going to uh, talk about today. Yeah. What's really cool about, uh, the story of Dutch gap canal, general Butler, general Butler was a hugely influential, influential man. Uh, so a lot of the press up North were following what he does. Uh, he's controversial, uh, and he's got friends, a lot of places. So the cameras, which, you know, are fairly new Mm -hmm. on the eve of the Civil War, but now they're just springing up everywhere on the battlefields. And uh, so there's some Civil War photography that comes to Dutch Gap Canal. And one of the most heavily photographed group of soldiers will be the 116th USCTs, specifically Mm -hmm. Company C that's there for the whole time. And the images that we have are depicting up close some of those soldiers uh, there's one in particular that shows a sergeant and a private outside this dugout. They all lived at Dutch Gap Canal. If you're there, you live underground, right? Because you're always under artillery fire, right? Very reminiscent of World War One, right? Uh, so here's these guys sitting outside this uh, bomb proof, as they're called, just between duty. Mm-hmm. And here's the photographer taking their image and lounging without their gear on. Uh, and one of which is a sergeant. And this guy is always used in a lot of Civil War books. It just mm-hmm. he's very iconic. Uh, the other image we have are just this other group of soldiers uh, passing through the two local plantations that are adjacent to Dutch Gap Canal, Cox's and uh, Aikens. Right. And these guys, you can just look at them and just go, those guys look like veterans. They mm-hmm. are veterans by this point. They've seen a lot they, of action. They've seen a lot of action. Yeah. And they're just passing between. A lot of these guys didn't mind going to do labor at Dutch Gap Canal because it pulls them off the trenches uh, Mm -hmm. in in, uh, Henrico County is where a lot of them were. And, okay, pretty easy service. Occasionally some artillery shells come in, but to them that's not too bad. Right, yeah. Um, So we use those images. Uh, There's there's probably a dozen we're using. We're going to put those on exhibit. And it really shows their faces, right? Mm -hmm. Like these are guys that were mostly – you know, enslaved people in Kentucky and now they are here winning a war and eventually will show up in Galveston as part of that emancipation force. Um, and we want to show who they are. We might not know exactly their names. We can't put all their names onto right. the picture, yeah. but we know what unit they are. Yeah. We know where they're from and we know in the outcome what happened to them. Yeah. Uh, so we want to eliminate that. That's part of our story at Henricus and uh, certainly Dutch Gap Canal. Yeah. Um, last couple of things for you. First off, I, we were talking a little bit before about sort of looking at, you know, looking at the images and some of the things that we can sort of learn about the the soldiers who are who are pictured. And I'm just curious, what can we, what can we kind of draw about maybe what their um, what their experience was like? Um, you mentioned specifically, um, and and I hope my director Martin will put this one on the screen for those of you who are, who are watching. Um, but there's this 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 one image of 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 the I guess this multi-starred uh, piece of what we assume is cloth. And we don't really know much about that. This is, I guess, a very rare sort of um, accessory, so to speak, right? Um, talk to me about just a little about what that tells us both about this soldier, but also just sort of the idea of 
of history in general. Cause it seems like this is a, this is a thing that even we look back now and, and look, 1860s was not that long ago. It feels a little bit longer now for some of us than maybe it did, you know, in the, in the eighties or nineties. Right. But it wasn't that long ago. And this is a piece of history that, that is it, it both is interesting in and of itself to know more about what this what their experiences were like, but then too, this this thing is lost to time in a lot of ways. That's right. Uh, the image uh, is going to be a sergeant in the one sixteenth USCTs. Uh, we we know of three or four sergeants. This guy might actually be. Right. We're not exactly sure which one. By his age, it might be a certain guy versus another, uh, but. When you look at his clothes, you know he's a veteran. The way he wears his stuff, the way he just, you know, just it's there. So when we looked at that star on yeah. his coat, you know, like we were talking earlier, it almost reminds you like uh, the guys in Vietnam who had the peace sign on their helmets. Right. This, like this is not issued to him. Right. This uh, is something that is specific to him, something to him. that he cares about, something that That's speaks right. to him, that he has decided he wanted to carry with him. That's right. And if you do, and again, I'm going to leave this to other experts right. you know, in the culture. These guys, most of them are are very spiritual, very religious. Right. That star apparently has some of those connections. And again, I don't want to speak without the authority to, yeah. to that star, mm-hmm. but I bet you there's people that are out there who focus on religious, uh, you know, icons and yep. say, yep. And we'll be able to look at that and go, oh, I think I have that idea. Right. So we're, we're really curious of our public, if you can help us identify why he would be wearing that as a soldier yeah. at the front in 1864, 1865. Yep. And then, you know, we don't know for sure that, that, that this specific soldier or that specific soldier made it all the way to Galveston, that they were there. But we know that that regiment was, that that group of soldiers was. And sort of the backdrop, if you think about what that message must have meant to the enslaved there to finally hear that good news, right. That took forever. You know, imagine waiting two years, you know, for something to, to trickle its way on for it to finally to reach you. And for this, this group of soldiers to sort of be part of the, of the, um, of the backdrop that sort of shows um, to kind of gives credence to it. Like not only are you hearing this thing that's real, but here are, you know, black soldiers who are here to sort of emphasize, right? I, I, I mm-hmm. can't imagine what that must have been like um, for those, you know, who were enslaved to hear and then to see just all of, you know, all of it there, you know, right in, in, in living color. Finally, that, that word to, to finally reach them. Yeah, Texas, you know, was a was a big place, uh, and actually, one half of Texas uh, by that point in eighteen sixty five, uh, there were still Confederate forces in the field there yeah. that were substantial. Uh, it's a big state, uh, so you know when those guys do come there. And the other thing to keep in mind is that if you have this idea of like, you know, who might be my heroes, right? You know, and and certainly in conflicts and soldiers in our past, people they have heroes, you know. Might not be everybody's heroes, but these might be yours. These guys would have been that for that community right. around Galveston. And specifically, think about this, but they, their bragging rights when they come to Galveston. The, most of the troops that were in Galveston had served in the West. Mm-hmm. Um, they weren't in the East serving uh, in Virginia. Those were Western soldiers. These guys are Eastern soldiers who had, by the way, helped bag Robert E. Lee in the Army of Northern Virginia. Right. And they probably stepped off those transports onto the wharf at Galveston into town. And when anyone's like, who are those guys? Those yeah. guys were probably like, yeah, we helped bag, you know, yeah. Robert E. Lee. Right. I mean, and if you think about it, you know, obviously they're going to be cent- several, you know, kind of seminal moments, you know, in any sort of conflict. In this one, you know, the first shots fired, the, the uh, surrender, and then, Juneteenth. I mean, right. they were there for two of them. I mean, and I'm not, you know, I'm mm-hmm. not going to sit here and try to pretend like I'm some sort of civil right. war um, um, expert or anything like that. But it certainly, and it certainly makes sense to me that there were other moments along the way of the war that were, you know, pivotal kind of moments in, in the conflict. But to think that there were, there was a group with connections to our community, to our mm-hmm. area That's right. that, that, that were there for two of them is just, it's kind of astonishing when you think about the big picture I mean, it's one of those stories that you, that Hollywood couldn't really write if you think about it. Yes, and you know, in Dutch Gap Canal is one of those uh, moments that's uh, the 
a stereotype of what a lot of those doubters, remember, even though they, the federal government was going to authorize this, there was still a lot of Northerners, influential Northerners, uh, who were of the mind that, well, all right, but, you know, we'll just give them shovels and let them build forts and that'll right. be it. Yep. Okay. They'll earn their, their monthly rate. There had to have been people in the military who wanted to see more than that. And Butler, who just happened to be here in Chesterfield and also across the right, whose army was across right. both counties, right? who decided, I'm going to show everyone mm-hmm. that these guys can do it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, sometimes it didn't work out. You know, the Battle of the Crater at Petersburg Mm. was not the best example. And it was not the fault of those USCT regiments. They weren't trained for the part they were playing in that. And that's that's another part of history. These guys at the canal Mm -hmm. are probably like, man, you know, this is kind of what was expected of us. Right. But, you know, their commander on one particular night, this is a huge moment probably in their history. Uh, December 17th, 1864, when the canal's almost done. The Rebs kind of were curious, you know, what's going on over there. And uh, they pushed really close on what's now our Dutch Gap Conservation Area. It's historically called Farrar's Island. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Captain uh, Thomas O'Reilly is now their major. He's commanding the, the garrison there. He decides to take these guys in a midnight raid on Confederate positions. Mm-hmm. And drives those Rebs all the way back across Farrar's Island, all the way to the James River, and gets them in, uh, to the point of capturing their pontoon that was crossing the river. Mm. And it must have been huge for these guys to launch that attack. Mm-hmm. We're successful. Right. And then a month later, here comes the Confederate James River Squadron around Farrar's Island looking to attack Grant's headquarters at City Point. Mm-hmm. Well, these guys are there on the shore and here comes this uh, flotilla Mm -hmm. and they're putting thousands of rounds at that flotilla and they're a part of that defeat. Yeah. And then you get through the spring and now they're a part of the Appomattox campaign now. So yeah, you're right. Like these guys evolved Mm -hmm. into wanting, you know, to to fulfill what Butler was going to promise and some others were going to promise Frederick Douglass's vision. Um, You remember Frederick Douglass's son was serving as a, as a soldier. Right. Right. Um, so you have all this going on and here these guys are, are proving what funny enough guys like back in George Washington's year in the revolution, they already knew these guys could fight just as good as anybody. Yeah. And here they are at this key moment. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's, it's really, it's, uh, it's, it's heartwarming yeah. to think about that. It absolutely is. Well, John, thank you very much for coming on the show, talking to us about the, the connections between Juneteenth and, Chesterfield and Rikus. I really appreciate you coming on. Oh, thanks for having me. All right. Now, make sure you check us out on social media. On Twitter, it's at Chesterfield VA. And on Instagram, it's Chesterfield Virginia, all one word. And on Facebook, you can check out our podcast page. Just search Chesterfield by the mic. Now, make sure to follow or subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Overcast, or wherever it is that you get your shows. And if you'd like to give us a rating or review, we'd greatly appreciate it. As always, a video version of the show is available on our YouTube channel as well as on our website, chesterfield.gov slash podcast. There's also... Uh, a place there where you can submit any feedback anytime, make suggestions, or just reach out to us. You can watch the show on WCCT Thursday through Sunday at 7 on the weekends at noon. That's Comcast Channel 98 and Verizon Channel 28. Lastly, you can check out chessfield.gov slash connect with us to find out a number of ways for you to get in touch with us, for us to get in touch with you. My thanks to my director, Martin Stiff, my executive producer, Treats Bonifas, and all the good folks from Constituent Media Services here for all that they do. And my thanks to you for joining us today. So, from all of us here in Chessfield, thanks again for making us a part of your day. We'll see you again real soon. Take good care.